Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I'll call a meeting to order. Um, we're short a few uh, trustees for a while. Uh, Trustee uh, Woods is not still under the weather, I believe, and Trustee Foley will be a bit late. So uh, not sure what time she'll be joining us. Uh, so anyway, I um, have a fairly long agenda, so let's get moving on it. Uh, first is a continuation of public hearing for chapter 126, vehicle and traffic. Um, we continued it because we, from kind of public feedback and discussion with the board, decided that we would, uh, you know, we would eliminate the change of one of streets to one way streets. Um, so that was the big difference in the chapter. Um, and because of that substantial change, we needed to uh, leave the uh, public hearing open. So uh, with that, um, um, the public hearing is, uh, I will make a motion to continue the public. I don't even know if we need to make a motion. It's, it's, it's been open. So if there's any public comment from anyone, we can take that now on the uh, vehicle and traffic chapter 126. I don't see any comments. Okay. Um, that said, I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, all in What's that? All in favor? Sorry, that Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, do we need to do anything further or not? We just need the resolution next time around, right? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, next is a workshop with Rec, who are all bunched up in a little room, it looks like. Hi, guys. Um, so uh, we thought, uh, you know, talking with Ruthann, uh, who's the uh, chair for Rec at the moment, and uh, uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to talk about the, uh, to get together and talk especially about the uh, events planning or how the events have been working and the pros and cons of them and on and on. So. With that, I will uh, give uh, the rec the floor and uh, and we'll go from there. Okay, so um, we have really spent a lot of time revising the two applications for use of um, recreation facilities in Cold Spring. Um, we sent you last week, I'm sure Maria's had time to go over in detail. I have. But, non-ticketed events and ticketed events. Um, we really tried to streamline it and address all of the issues that we've had um, over the last you know, several years with them to make sure everything is covered. I think we have really streamlined them and separated them. So someone from the village who just wants to have a birthday party at the pavilion or a wedding at the bandstand would use the non-ticketed event application and someone who wanted to use it for a ticketed event or a sales application, it's separate, you know, with differentiated um, differences. Um, in preparation for um, the event plan, the event coordinator, we have made recommendations for changes of the fees and we could go over those. So I didn't know if anybody, if you, Marie, did you want to start with one or the other? Why don't we do the ticketed events first, Ruthann? Sure. Okay. My, my, let me just skip to the, the back. Okay. Um, so in thinking about it, this, this permits up to, up to 2,000 people. Correct. In thinking about that, I don't think the village can tolerate 2,000 people at a ticket of, ticketed event with, with the vendors and the vendor's assistance and whatnot. So my recommendation would be, and, and this, this has nothing to, you, you've done fantastic job on the two packages, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but I would recommend that we cut the number down. Well, one of the things, if I might, jump in is does the 2000 actually mean that they're all going to be there at one time it depends upon the type of event right can't hear you depends upon the type of event. still can't hear you okay there you go stay right there right. Yeah, don't okay. move. it depends on the type of event 
as to whether or not they'll all be there at the same time. Well, that's true. I think that the, the wine fest and the beer fest, they wouldn't all be there at the same time, right? I, I don't know where the 2000 comes from. I, I can tell you where the 2000 came from. The 2000 came from the police department. Yeah. That's where the original number came from. Um, how many people they felt occupied the space um, and they would be able to manage that. Um, it, you're right, it doesn't say 2,000 in the whole event. I'm assuming it means 2,000 a day. So if you have an event on Saturday, you could have up, you could sell up to 2,000 tickets for Saturday. And if you had it on Sunday, you could sell another 2,000 tickets on Sunday. Okay, so I think what we're saying is there would be 2,000, they would be allowed to sell up to 2,000 tickets. You're right, that would not include the vendors who would be there. So it might be, um, I would say from, from the from the previous event we just had, we parked 40 cars at the um, highway department. Some vendors were parked at the field. So I would say you could probably say that there's probably between 100 and 150 between vendors and staff that are there also. So, I, I mean, I, I don't think anybody has a problem if you want to change that number to mm -hmm. how many tickets are sold. I mean, that's what you feel the village can absorb. Can we, can we say um, maximum 2,000, including vendors and et cetera, et cetera, or can we just break the number down to 1750 and we'll go with that? 1750 tickets, if you want to put it that way, tickets sold. Has, has there been a problem in the past with the numbers? No. Yeah, I, I, remember, remember, I, I can't remember what it was like when we had the hops on the Hudson. That was the last one we would have had, but there was a large group in the wine festival before the pandemic. I don't know how many tickets she sold for this last go around, but there were not 2,000 people there. I would say maybe there were maybe 500 at a time. Yeah, I remember Larry specifically uh, giving us a number of how many that they can manage. Uh, so I don't, I don't remember, but if we're going, if you say he said 2,000, then I'll go with that. That would be total, including the vendors. So I, think, I don't think we should ask them to tell us what, how many vendors. I think we should change the amount to assume that there's going to be about 250 vendors and staff. I think to go to them and say how many vendors you can have for event is a bit of a challenge. It adds another layer. Well, whatever number we put on it, we should just put including vendors and sellers, right? If it's 1,500 or whatever, including vendors and sellers. That works. Yeah. I'm good with that. And if you want to, 75, I'm making, if you want to drop it, make it 1500, or unless that's too much too. No, I don't, I don't think 1500 is too much, but. Okay, so we're going to take that to say, including vendors and staff. Reduce it to 15. Are we going to keep it at the 2000 or reduce it? I say we drop it to fifteen hundred. Me and Siegel agree. Well, I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. We'll make that. We'll revise that. Still on the last page, Ruthann. Um, the a highway department vendor parking. I think that should be. I think that should be required. It is. It says that in- You're right. It says it in the text. Um, we could refer to it here with, they say in number whatever in the text. Okay. Uh, if it says it in the text, that's fine. Yeah, but we could add number. Um, yeah. Jeff, we'll look and see what number that is. And we'll add that number in that section. In the, 20. It's number 20. 20. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll cross-reference it with the details. Great. And then in the application for ticketed use of Mayor's Park Field, uh, Mayor's Park Pavilion, McConville Park, and Bandstand, 
bandstand is on both applications. Is that intended to be the case? Where do you see bandstand on ticketed events? At the top of the application. Oh, the title of the application. And then it's also under facilities requested. Okay. Yeah, we'll cross out the bandstand and, okay. and the Convo Park. Great, great. Okay. Thank you. See, we need another set of eyes. We've been looking at it too long. I have some um, uh, grammar and um, uh, changes. I, I just have this in a in a PDF. Could you send it to me in a Word document, and I'll just send it back to you with my recommended changes. Yep, I sent it to you in Word. Yes, no problem. Oh, great, great. Uh, you can just take your markup and leave it in our mailbox. Okay, I can do that too. Yeah, why don't you just leave your markup in the recreation mailbox, and someone will pick it up and. No problem. Okay, on the non non ticketed events. Okay, before, can we get back before, to ticket before, event? Did anybody have a question about the um, fees? Um, no, but I have a question on the text of ticketed, if you want to do that before we move on. Okay. Um, probably more. Um, this is actually in both of them. Um, I know that the Recreation Committee um, makes a recommendation and the Village Board makes the decision, but the board notifying the applicant uh, I'm not sure that that should fall back onto the village clerk. What number are you at? I'm at number three. Okay. The last line of number three, the village board will notify the applicant of their decision. I'm not sure that should fall back on the village clerk or should it fall back on your, uh, on the rec committee. Um, okay, we'll look at that. So that was one. And then number four, there was just one other thing. Um, it's a registered not-for-profits. Um, may reserve locations. And I just wanted to put in there if available, because the not-for-profits are coming in three weeks prior and everyone else is coming in eight weeks prior. So, so the time, you know, the location may be already booked. So um, the Cold Spring res may reserve locations if available free of charge. So not that they can bounce somebody else out. Available. Okay. Done. 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 Marie, you'll send us, you'll just put in our mailbox your suggested revisions. Great. Yes, yes, I will. I'll, I'll do that tomorrow, first thing. Great, okay. I know that you're gonna be discussed, we're gonna be discussing the uh, a planner of sorts. Uh, so that'll be included after the discussion on the uh, the fees and security. Well, we, we, we've built that in. Um, we just want to, we didn't redline this, but if you look at the last page, Mayor's Park only used to be $1,000. Uh -huh. Additional use of the pavilion was $250. Um, we anticipated, um, I, I kind of with Michelle got some numbers um, that the village itself in preparation, the highway department probably spent about 30 hours no, no, I'm sorry, they didn't spend 30 hours. They spent about 20 hours getting the, everything organized. Um, if we hired an event planner, the event planner would probably spend 30 plus hours on a two day ticketed event. So that's why we changed, we increased the amount by $1,000. Actually we increased it by um, $1,250 a day. Okay, I would I'd maybe recommend if we once you get interviewing uh, applicants for that, maybe they'll think it'll go, or maybe we can adjust that that cost if they think it's I don't know about thirty hours. That seems a bit excessive. Well, but it might. I mean, if it's a full day, two days, I guess. The event itself runs ten hours. Okay. And the day before and the day after. So yeah, you are talking thirty hours. Okay. And that's not including meeting with them beforehand and making sure they've done everything that they have to do. Right. Okay. I'm good. Okay, great. 
And the non-ticketed events? I would recommend on the non-ticketed events uh, that the Mayor's Park Pavilion uh, for $100 would be limited to, to four hours and that any additional hours are at the rate of $25 an hour. And that's for residents and uh, for the same thing for Phillips Town residents uh, at it be an additional $50 an hour. I mean, $100, $100 for four hours use of the pavilion is a bargain, an absolute bargain. It, it is, but then you get into the issue of, men, of who's going to be supervising exactly how many hours they're there. Um, so we rather than do that, we just increased um, it was $25 a day for Cold Spring residents and $50 for Phillipstown residents. Mm -hmm. um, we changed the bandstand. It used to be $250 for Cold Spring residents. We changed that, we reduced that to $125, kept Phillipstown at $250, and non residents at $500. Bernie, my opinion is that we want village residents to use it. I know it's a bargain. Uh, we're, we're not Boscobel. You know, I'm trying to encourage. That's the other. The flip side is trying to. You know, it's for our residents who pay taxes. It is. It is a bargain, but you know, we want people to use it. I mean, that's my feeling. No, I, I was. Four hours. The thing in mind, John, was I think there was an event a couple of last month or the month before. It was an eight-hour event. Yeah, the trees, yes. Seven. The graduations, yep. I guess. Yeah. And that, that ended up being $12.50 an hour. That is like an incredible bargain. Well, I'm fine with the 100 for four hours. Yeah. Not to make it like you know, outrageous. So. No, but I agree, 100 for four hours. And I think the majority of, of the events at the pavilion are in the range of four hours. It's unusual, I think, to have a a six or an eight hour event there. And I'm, I'm just suggesting that when you have an event that goes longer than four hours, uh, you know, maybe it shouldn't be $25 an hour extra. Maybe it should be $15 an hour extra. 25 is fine. I think 25 is fine. Yeah, and it's gonna come down to the planner. It'll be the event planner. They'll have to coordinate that before. They're gonna open and close the event. So I, I think an extra $25 an hour is easily doable. For anything over so four you're hours. saying for four hours, these amounts we have here for four hours, okay? Mm -hmm. And then for the hundred dollars for four hours. And Twenty-five each additional. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Fifteen or twenty or twenty-five. But if if you're going to have an event plan or working on this, then that person's fees need to be calculated in as well. Okay. Okay, they have to determine. If somebody comes to us for six hours, we say 150 bucks. Yeah. You just have to make sure they indicate it on the, on the form how many hours. It wouldn't be like, okay, well, we want an extra hour at the end of it. Whatever. Well, we do ask them that time. Right, okay. So start time, time and time. Yeah. We're really careful about making sure they understand it opens at eight and closes at nine. Yes. Everything has to be out by nine. It's carry in and carry out. Yeah, you know. you know, that is really good. Yeah, I think if we have a planner that you can't, I mean, I think it should, they're going to have to go down and close and stuff. And it can't be like the time that they're actually spending there. I mean, it should be like 20 bucks a shot or something. Like if, if, you know, if someone's going to take the middle of their day or the beginning of their day and go down there and have to open up, make sure everything's unlocked or whatever, and then go back the end of the day, that's also, you know, going to break up their day. So that's, that's kind of asking a lot. And if people are willing to do that's fine. But I mean, I think that should be like $40 or it should be 20 bucks. It should be a minimum of two hours at whatever rate you've decided they're going to exactly. I agree. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, can't expect, even maybe three hours. You can't expect somebody to go down there, you know, like we've been doing and, you know, break up. So I'll just make sure that that's included in the fee. And I agree with John that we should 
you know, it's for the residents, it's, you know, so. Yeah. On the, um, the fees and security for the non-ticketed events, the Mayor's Park Fields, I assume that's not including the pavilion, right? Just the fields for $50? Right. So maybe we need to clearly say fields only or something to that effect because the pavilion is more. Okay. Uh, for the non ticketed events or for the use of the pavilion, does that also mean the bath? I, I'm sorry, I didn't read through it all. Um, does that also mean the bathrooms will be available for the non ticketed or for the smaller events? Yes. Okay. On the um, non-ticketed events, uh, there's a question, will there be a tent? And um, I'm, I'm fine with what you say there, but there's no indication that the code enforcement officer has to inspect the tent. Is And, and that is a requirement on the ticketed events. Is that because in general, the tents for the non-ticketed Ticketed events are, are smaller. They're the kind that people have for their backyards. And so there's no need for. Yes. Okay. If they rent, if they rent a number tent, number 13, we, want to see the, we want to see the contract. So we know it's by a reputable company that's doing it. The, cha the challenge happened recently um, was that the tent company comes on Friday. Right. And the code enforcement officer doesn't work on Friday. Right. So, I mean, that was yes, saying to people they have to have their tent put up on the date that the code enforcement officer was there. Number 13 on the policies for non ticketed events does say the code it has to be inspected. Oh, it does say it there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very good, Fran. I missed it. Sorry, Ruth Ann. Okay, but I'll write that number 13 on that bottom section there. But I'm just saying it becomes an issue because the code enforcement person does not work on Friday. So it's something you're gonna to have to consider having the person come in if, they, if there's a one shot kind of thing that that happens. Uh, in the case of the recent one, it was Durant that came and we could have seen their contract ahead of time and felt that then we have a company that you know, does that, putting them up, and is that enough? Yeah. So that might have, that's a big thing for the event planner, and maybe something we have to add, Trevor, to the event planner that, that they have to coordinate with the code enforcement officer. So that's Trevor, Trevor's been working on that. Mm -hmm. so Charlotte is available on Saturdays. I think she's here most of the time. I know that's after the fact that they've set it up, but we could get some get her down there on a Saturday. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so, Marie, you have grammar issues that you want to send us. We'll fix that, and then yep. we'll, we'll adjust the prices um, to come up with a, another another draft, a revision of this. And if there's anyone else who has anything else that they think needs to change, if you just mark up your copy and put it in the recreation mailbox, that would be good. My, my compliments. Uh, the Recreation Commission did a fantastic job uh, on both of these uh, packages. They're really well done. They, okay. they spell, spell out everything that, that people need to know. Nicely done. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You guys did a great job. Make sure that everything was covered, but don't worry, there'll be something not covered. <laughs> <laughs> Always is. <laughs> okay, we had a couple of other things um, on our notes that we sent in. Um, you see that I have submitted my resignation as of October 20th. We don't really want to accept that, Ruth. Yeah. I just I'll show you. I just handed Jeff a handbook. Did you deny that request? Yeah. <laughs> we can. Yeah. 
<laughs> so the, the commission is recommending that Jeff Ahmad, to the mayor who appoints him, that, that Jeff um, step up as the chairperson of the commission. And I also forwarded to you our recommendation of Aaron Leonard, who's actually online, I see. I gave him the link for tonight's meeting um, uh, to be uh, the new commission member. I mean, he's got some great experience. Um, he has a lot of muscles. He was there the other night, the other day with us with the 9-11 Memorial. There's Aaron. So um, I think he's going to be help with our goal of increasing the uh, use of Mayor's Park for recreation. So we'll leave that in your hands because that's your job. What was that? I'm sorry. I said, we'll leave that, what you want to do with that in your hands. Okay. Do you want to make a motion on that? Which, which part? There's several, several items in there. <laughs> There's a resignation, there is a, an appointment and another appointment. The appointments. So, uh, I guess I will reluctantly uh, ask, accept the resignation of Ruth Ann Cullenbar um, as of October 20th. Um, uh, Ruth Ann, I just say you did a great job. And, and actually the whole kind of getting this whole uh, the rec commission back, back together and uh, just, you've, I think you've all did a great job. Really, I really have. It's, uh, um, it's going in the right direction and uh, so th thank you so much, all of you, and and John and Sieg, you've been there for I don't know how many years. So uh, it's great to have you there and have legacy. And uh, Trevor being on there, and Jeff, I'm really glad that you stepped up. It's good to see some fresh blood. So uh, Ruthann, uh, thank you so much. And uh, with that, uh, I'll make a motion uh, to accept that resignation. Respectfully, I second the motion. All in favor. I, Ruthann, thank you so much to the rec committee. And I, from someone who was on it years ago, it's never been in the great shape it's in now. So thank you so much. <laughs> Everybody's worked very hard. Do we accept the- uh, No, we're going next to them. Okay, next I'll make a uh, recommendation or uh, I'd like to appoint Jeffrey Amato Jr. as the chair of rec commission to take Ruthann's place. I'll okay. second that. Ruthann's got that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome, Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much for stepping up. <laughs> you, Jeff, thank you, Jeff. It's great. Thank you. And the next is a recommendation from the commission um, to add Aaron Michael Leonard uh, to the vacant position on the commission. And I'd like to uh, make that, uh, I'd like to uh, appoint uh, Aaron Michael to that position as recommended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome, Aaron. Aaron. Welcome. There's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Is there uh, anything else on there? Oh, there's the increase the use of Mayor's Park, but that is, uh, you want to explain that a bit? Uh, is it just to uh, yeah, I I guess, that's just our goal. And we're going to okay. keep going on saying that we want to keep that focus. So you're always going to be seeing increase the use of Mayor's Park for recreation. We think Michael's going to be a great, I mean, Aaron, Michael is going to be a great addition out of that. We just have a couple of applications. In fact, we got two more today. So it's a very, been a very busy fall. The Gold Spring Girl Scouts would like to use the pavilion on October 17th. They're having their, you know, get out the Girl Scouts kind of thing at the pavilion on the 17th from one to three. So just, we've approved that. We just want to let you know what's gonna happen. The Magazino Italian Art on October 16th and 17th is gonna use the bandstand from nine until three. Um, they, three to five. Nine to five, thank you. I could sing with Dolly Parton too now. That I um, at, they have a 1950s Fiat art piece um, that is going to be, uh, picking up passengers at the bandstand and going on a half hour tour of Cold Spring. Um, uh, a staff member from the, uh, the Art Institute will uh, remain at the bandstand during the rides so that you know they'll be there to supervise the people. 
as well as move cones as the car needs to come around and drop off and pick up people. Right now, we have, I have it established with them that we ju they're just going to pick up four cones um, and they're going to take care of the moving the cones back and forth. They can't put the stanchions up because there is going to be a vehicle going around. So, is that okay? Uh, sounds good. Sounds I would great. just, I, I think that uh, C Street comes in at 10 30. So, yeah, just tell them not to run too many people over. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Thank you, guys. The Cold Spring Chamber um, wants to use the bandstand on October 30th for the Halloween parade. Uh, they do that every year. Um, and I guess there won't be a rain, rain day because the next day is Halloween. And then the Halloween Senior Class uh, wants to use the pavilion on October 17th, which is a Friday? It's a conflict. It's a conflict. Conflict with the Girl Scouts. Oh, it's going to be the same day then. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, thank you. It's October 15th. Which it's one? Me. The, the Haldane Seniors, it's October 15th. 15th. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you need to get rid of me. I can't do date. <laughs> um. I think you're doing it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to come down with the whole senior class um, to the pavilion from 9 to 2. Um, 75 seniors and five adults. So and the C Street will be there that day as well. What? What's my effect? Friday. But that, but that, they're going to be at the pavilion. Oh, I'm sorry. They're going to be at the pavilion. Okay. At the pavilion. I think for the wedding on the 23rd that they should be aware that uh, C Street. We'll, we'll be around. I mean, I, I think that they get picked up. So it might, they might not be uh, interfering whatsoever, but because they don't get picked up till 3.30, but you just be aware of that for any of the set, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday events at the bandstand. Right. Mm -hmm. so, they may not get a good view of pictures if the sea streak stays in. Yeah. If they want pictures of the, the river, that may be an issue. Well, um, one of the Phillips Town Council members um, is also use, getting having a wedding that day. And they might even try to slip in and get pictures taken at the same time. But I told them that we have a wedding there that day. And if they want to run in and get pictures at some time, they'd have to just figure it out. <laughs> Yes, he, should, he would know if these streets are there too, right? So it's been a busy fall as far as the pavilion and the bandstand <laughs> and C Street. Oh, yes. So I think there's the, the last thing is the planner. You have come up with a description, which is great. And uh, so are, have you finalized that or? The job description for the event planner? Yes. No. Okay. So, um, but if you want to take a look at that and you have anybody else look at it and give us some feedback. Okay. That would be great. I mean, I, I think the other issue is it's not in the budget. You know, that, that position is not in the budget and any funds, you know, that's a question that you, you'll have to address. Well, I think if it's like per event that it'll be paid for by the event that right. I don't think it has to be included in the budget. It's not going to be coming out of a, the monies we have. That's, I'm sure that's something you could discuss with Michelle because my understanding is all about funds going, any any income that the Recreation Commission makes goes into the general fund. So We do have to budget for it, but we just need to discuss with Michelle how to best but the income and the expenses on it, revenue and expenses. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? No. Thank you for your cooperation. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you all. Yeah. I, I would recommend a report, but we did get up. Um, everybody's sitting here, <laughs> pretty much, and and uh, Aaron um, and some other people. Frenchie is that Frenchie? A lefty. Lefty, lefty Frenchie. 
we did begin the cleanup of the 9-11 memorial um, and done and uh, we purchased some plant from perennials. So hopefully by 9-11 of next year, um, it'll be all up and running and beautifully planted with perennials and in good signage. Shape. And maybe even a signage because we do have a Eagle Scout who's um, Jeff is working with um, who wants to do a sign um, for the 9-11 memorial. Yeah, that'll nice. come to you before anything happens with it because you'll have to approve it. A lot of people don't even know, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys all for your time. Thank okay. you so much. Yes. Like I said you did a great job and are continuing to do so. And thank you so much, Ruthann. It's a pleasure working with you. Yeah. Uh, Ruthann, will we see you Tuesday next week for the monthly meeting? I will, I will try. I have to go to a funeral in Massachusetts. I don't know if I'll be back until okay. I'm calling you from my car. Is that going to be for the Red Sox? <laughs> no, it's going to be for the Yankees. Red Sox are going to be flying so. high. <laughs> That's not nice. I know, right? That's not nice. They're going to play pretty soon. Tonight. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Good night, all. Good night. Jim, we'll Okay, continuing on with our agenda. Uh, next, we have uh, Resolution 67. 2021 uh, neg, neg, neg declaration for chapters 111 and 124. Uh, let's see, I guess I will read this. Uh, so uh, let's see, I'll make a motion to accept the uh, planning for a neg deck uh, chapter 111 and 124. Second. Okay, whereas the village of Cold Spring Board of Trustees is the CICRA lead agency for conducting the environmental review for adoption of two chapters of village code 111 uh, subdivisions of land and 124 unsafe buildings within the village of Cold Spring, Putnam County, New York. And whereas there are no other involved local or federal agencies pursuant to CICRA, and whereas the village board has reviewed the environmental assessment form for the action, including the part one, part two, and part three dated 9-2-21, the probable en environmental uh, effects of the action against the criteria for determining significance and has considered such impacts as disclosed in the EAF. Now therefore be resolved that the village board adopts the findings and conclusions relating to probable environmental effects contained within the uh, attached mm -hmm. EAF and negative declaration and authorize the mayor to execute the EAF and file the negative declaration in accordance with the applicable provisions of law and be it further resolved that the village board authorizes the mayor to take further uh, steps as might be necessary to discharge the lead agency responsibilities on this act. Roll call. Trustee Early. Yes. Uh, Trustee Foley is absent, Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Woods is absent and May Morandi. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, resolution 68, 2021, adopting uh, local law 30 of 2021, amending chapter 111, subdivision of land. I'll make a motion to adopt. Second. I'll second. Whereas the Village of Cold Spring Board of Trustees this cause to be prepared a draft of the local law to amend chapter 111 subdivision of land of the village code and whereas the village of Cold Spring Board of Trustees held a duly noticed public hearing on the draft local law on September 7, 2021 and whereas the village of Cold Spring Board of Trustees have complied with the requirements of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CICRA, as it applies to the adoption of the draft local law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that local law number 30 of 2021 is hereby adopted and the village clerk is authorized and directed to take all the actions necessary to complete the local law adoption procedure, including filing said local law with the New York State Office of Secretary of State. Trustee Early. Yes. Trustee Foley is absent. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Woods is absent. Mayor Morandi. Aye. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, next, we have Resolution uh, 69, 2021, adopting Local Law 31 of 2021, adding Chapter 124, Unsafe Building. I will make a motion to adopt. Okay, okay uh, whereas the village of Coles from Board of Trustees has caused to be prepared a draft of the local law to repeal chapter 124 unsafe buildings to the village code and whereas the village of cold spring board of trustees held a duly noticed public hearing on the draft law on september 7 2021 and whereas the village of cold spring board of trustees have complied with the requirements of the state environmental quality review act secra as it applies to the adoption of the draft local law now, therefore, be resolved that Local Law 31 of 2021 is hereby adopted, and the village clerk is authorized and directed to take all the actions necessary to complete the local law adoption procedure, including filing said local law with the New York State Office of the Secretary of State. Trustee Early. Jeff, Jeff, before we take the, the vote, um, the first whereas clause. From, yeah, it needs to be changed from repeal to add. To, okay, thank you. So it's as amended. Okay. Trustee Early? Yes. Trustee Foley is absent. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Woods is absent. Mayor Mirandi? Aye. Okay, next. Sorry about that, folks. What's that? Sorry about that one. <laughs> Uh, next is resolution number 70, 2021, adopting local law 32 of 2021, repealing chapter 101 shopping carts. I'll make a motion to adopt local law 32 and repeal shopping cart. Second. Where the village of Coles from Board of Trustees is caused to be prepared a draft of the local law to repeal chapter 101 shopping carts of the village code. And whereas the village of Cold Spring Board of Trustees held the duly noticed public hearing on the draft local law on September 28, 2021. And whereas the Village of Coles from Board of Trustees has complied with the requirements of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CECRA, as it applies to the adoption of the draft local law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that local law number 32 of 2021 is hereby adopted and the village clerk is authorized and directed to take all the actions necessary to complete the local law adoption procedure, including filing said local law with the New York State Office of the Secretary of State. Trustee Early? Yes. Trustee Foley is absent. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Woods is absent. May Mirandi? Aye. The next two pages is just the local law that John, that we will file with the Secretary of State that John prepared. Okay, thanks for that. I was wondering where we're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an F, that was just attached for informational purposes. Okay, next is uh, resolution 71, 2021, awarding the bid for rebuilding the stone wall. Uh, this is the stone wall on Main Street. Um, I guess from B, between B and Orchard Street on the uh, on the north side of Main Street, um, we like we put out an RFP. Had several bidders. Um, Donald McDonald's been handling um, that end of it. He's uh, done all of the reviews. Has met with the uh, applicant or the one that, the person that uh, he'd like to award it to, which was the lowest bidder. And uh, that said. Um, if there's any other questions on that before I get into this, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, thank. First of all, thank you, Donald McDonald. He's done a, a, a great job. He drafted the uh, the RFP and has done uh, you know really did a thorough job of uh, checking on the backgrounds of the lowest bidder and is satisfied with all of the uh, replies that he's got. So I'll make a motion to to award. Uh, to award the bid for rebuilding the stone wall, resolution 71, 2021. I'll second it. Where the village of Cold Spring Village needs to rebuild portion of the stone wall located on the north side of Main Street between B and Orchard Street. And whereas the village solicited <laughs> bids via the Empire State bid system and required legal notice in the, in the village's newspaper of record. And whereas the village received the total total of eight bids, and whereas Donald McDonald Architect reviewed the submissions of the three lowest bidders and has made a recommendation to the village, therefore, 
It is hereby resolved that the village awards the bid for the rebuilding of the stone wall on the north side of Main Street between B and Orchard Street to the lowest bidder, Jebco, Jebco Construction, at a cost of $87,000, plus the cost of supplying an addi any additional wall stone necessary at a cost of $2,500 per pallet. Trustee Early. Murphy. Trustee Foley is absent. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Woods is absent. Mayor Morandi. Aye. Thank you again, Donald. I appreciate all the work you put into this, and it'll be nice to see that finally, finally done. Uh, next is request to hold the Halloween parade. Um, includes the use of the bandstand. Do we have, uh, is Melissa on? No, she is not. Oh. <laughs> okay. Questions are from the board. Um, I did have a question earlier, but um, Jeff explained that we don't usually get a, a, a permit. We don't usually issue a permit for the parade. We just issue a permit for the use of the uh, bandstand. So I'm fine with it. I guess they do have to get permission to do the parade. And I don't know if that's come through yet or not, but that's just, I guess, Dave, your, your approval on that. So I'm fine with it. There is a truck on parades and it requires, parades require the, um, uh, approval of the mayor. What was that? Sorry. Um, parades require the approval of the mayor. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just looking over this. Now, did they, the, I think the one thing, and I thought we had kind of made this kind of uh, clear last time that we needed some kind of type of person coordinating this, which, you know, because all the people hang out on the lawn, there's no one that's uh, organizing or, or actually directing anybody. And I, I know we brought this up the last time, which was two years ago, uh, but I, I don't see anybody or who do we, do we contact? Melissa, is she the person, I guess she's the designated contact, but uh, there's, there seems to be a lack of coordination on that or some people, I think Larry had to actually use a bullhorn last time and move people along. That, that's my only concern. It's like, it would be good to have like uh, some people and have this coordinated a little better. There's a lot of people there to corral and get, get moving. But um, I, I would assume that will come when they ask for the parade. Because this is just asking for the use of the bandstand or. or... Oh. I suspect nobody's going to come forward and ask for the parade. What's that? I suspect no one's going to come forward and ask for the parade. Uh, I, maybe yeah. Nat, maybe Nat Prentice. When she brought the application in, her request was, here's the application for the bandstand and the parade. The bandstand is for after the parade. She just does not say that. No. I'm just relaying what she had yeah. conveyed to me. Maybe Nat Prentice want to hold on this until we talk to Nat? I'd like to hold on this and we can... Um, if we all agree to have the meeting Thursday, which you know, I guess that's up to Bugsy, um, the meeting I'd like to have, uh, and hold it till then, until late, you know, and and you know, ask them to have a couple of coordinators, the people to kind of that Larry can coordinate with, or at the day of the event can you know can actually direct the all of the people that are there, you know, whenever whenever that's needed, because it seems like it's just a free for all and. Which I guess can work out also, but I'd like to see talk to Nat or whoever the chamber is and see if they can add a little more uh, somebody for direction on that. If everyone's okay with that, yeah, I'm fine with that. So we'll table this. What's that? We'll table this. Yeah, we'll table this. Okay. And can you reach? Can you reach out, Fran, to uh, Nat? Sure. And see if we can coordinate something or have a couple of people that we can talk to. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe make a formal request for the uh, for the parade itself. Right. Start which uh, we'll have start time and uh, and things like that. Whatever. Okay. So I'll make um, 
just to make it formal, I'll make a, a motion to table the request for the bandstand use for the Halloween parade uh, for now. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Okay, uh, next is a uh, request for relief regarding short term rentals. Mr. Marzal? I guess I'm going on for that. Uh, boy, you guys are going to miss this. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously I came for, first of all, thank you for honoring my request for relief. Thank you for hearing me. I know it's been a long meeting, so I'll try to be brief. Um, obviously, I've come forward on public hearings and spoken already about, um, you know, the law. So I'm not going to repeat myself about any of that. But I do want to say after reading uh, Cold Spring Code Chapter 100, um, you know, a few hundred times, I kept coming back to uh, Chapter 100-14 appeals. Any person aggrieved by the provision of this chapter may apply to the village board for relief who shall hear the matter and make final decisions. So I've come before you for relief and I, I feel like this part of this law was put in um, for anyone uh, uh, to consider their personal situation as opposed to the situation of the town as a whole. So I just wanna speak a little bit about my personal situation, our personal situation and uh, appeal to you guys for a bit of relief on, on this uh, chapter 100. So um, I'm just gonna give you a, a real quick history. In January, 2020, my wife and I put a deposit down to build a new house on Lane Gate Road. We had been in my small house for 10 years and uh, you know we now have a family of five and we're really kind of crammed in here. And uh, in that time, we tried to spend our effort uh, our money and our time uh, and our energy on building the business that we had in the village rather than focusing on, on our house because we felt by building the business, we would subsequently be able to build enough capital to put ourselves in a better living situation. So a few months before COVID, we made a large deposit on a house that we felt we would be able to afford um, given our savings and given uh, the business that we had been working on for all those years. Of course, as you all know, a few months later, um, COVID-19 erupted across the country and everything shut down. So um, I remember when it first shut down and I, my first thought was, uh, you know, that I would repaint the yoga studio because, you know, things would be shut down for a few weeks and we'd never have the opportunity to do this again. So I went in there and I repainted. And I remember I would spend, you know, 10 or 12 hour days in there because I thought I would only have a short amount of time and I had to get it done in time. But sure enough, uh, the pandemic stretched on, the shutdown continued. Uh, eventually I finished that project. I started painting the hallways, started redoing the stairs, the, the offices, uh, you know, the floors. And, and uh, sure enough, um, eventually I realized that this was gonna be a year long shutdown at minimum. So um, here we were with a huge financial commitment of a house that we had already started and a project that we believed we'd be able to afford, but our business had totally tanked because of situations totally outside of our control of the pandemic. And um, you know, even as things started to reopen, exercise facilities were the very last thing to reopen and rightfully so. People are breathing hard indoors in closed confined spaces. We were able to shift our business to Boscobel for outdoor yoga, but then we had to split the revenue with Bosco Bell and uh, pay the yoga teacher as well as someone to work the class. So we soon realized that we weren't gonna get any revenue from that project either, but it, it was important to us because we could still keep our yoga teachers employed and we could keep the person that ran our office employed. So we kept going with that just because we wanted to be able to you know, uh, uh, make sure that the people that were counting us on us could still count on us. Meanwhile, in the building, a lot of our tenants came to us and said, we can't stay as tenants because we can't have people in the building, so we can't pay our rent. So everyone that came to us with hardship concerns, we gave rent deals to. Some people we said they didn't have to pay rent at all. Some people paid half rent until they were able to reopen. Um, but of course, you know, we still had to pay our bills. We still had to pay our taxes, rightfully so. So uh, we, you know, we were left losing a lot of money on the business side 
And also with this financial commitment of building a house on our personal side uh, that we weren't able to generate any new revenue from. And that just continued and continued and continued. And, uh, you know, we were between a rock and a hard place. We didn't know where to turn until my wife suggested, hey, you know, why don't we just drag some furniture up there and start an Airbnb because there was no other way that we could possibly stop the bleeding. So we did that and, uh, and it worked. You know, we got people from the city to come up. We got people to come visit the town. We weren't in violation of the shutdown. We, we maintained COVID protocols, but we were able to, you know, make money again to honor our commitments. But it was a long time after, after COVID started and we had already, you know, built big bills up on our personal side and also big bills up on the business side. So, um, you know, a lot of that happened before uh, we started going to the public hearings, before we realized that this ball was in motion and seeing the writing on the wall that this was gonna pass, um, you know, we were relying on the Airbnb, um, which we had gotten into, you know, solely out of necessity. So at this point, um, we're still a ways to go. We're still catching up on the business. We're still catching up on the house. But um, I do feel like we have in some ways become an unintended consequence of this uh, building code chapter 100. Um, because as I look through purpose, and I know I said this in, in a meeting, so I'll be really quick. But when I look through the, the items in purpose of this law, I realize not a lot of it actually applies to us on a personal level. And I understand where you guys are going with this. And I have said that I agree with, with some of it. Um, but you know, as I look at my own personal situation, which my appeal now is strictly personal, I realize that um, you know, we don't make extra parking, you know, 100, 100-1B, uh, 100 we don't make extra parking. We don't make extra garbage. We never have more garbage than fits in our two cans. You know, we, we can't, you can't say that we don't preserve the residential and community character of our village because at a public hearing, our neighbor came forward and said, I can't believe you've been Airbnb for six months. I didn't even know that was happening. So it's not like we're diminishing our neighborhood or creating any more noise. Um, and also, you know, we don't really affect the, the, uh, the character of our neighborhood. As well, we're not really um, affecting the number of full-time residents or taking away from, from full-time residents because, you know, in effect, we're a yoga studio, we're a wellness center. We're not trying to be a permanent Airbnb. We're just trying to Airbnb long enough to catch up from the financial damage that we sustained during COVID. You know, in a perfect world, we'll be able to, to someday be able to cover our financial end, hopefully with the aid of this Airbnb, if possible, and, and we can go back to being a yoga studio. And I know that it has been suggested that we could, um, you know, apply to be um, a bed and breakfast through the state, but you know, we're not a bed and breakfast and we don't wanna be a bed and breakfast. We wanna be a wellness center. We just need this income from our Airbnb just to help us get, get back out of the pit that we were put in from the hardship of COVID. And I don't blame you guys. And, and I don't blame our, us, you know, it wasn't our fault. Just, you know, COVID happened and it affected everyone. But people in the exercise industry, people in the yoga industry, I think uh, were affected, you know, as much or more than anyone. So, you know, in short, when I look at this, I, I look at 100-14 as an opportunity for you guys to help someone, you know, and, and, and again, I'm not trying to fight the law anymore. I'm just sort of illustrating our personal situation. And, you, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I am a coach and I am a scout leader and, and uh, I do serve on boards. I serve on three boards. So, you know, I, I hope you guys will see that I'm, I'm a contributing member to society and my Airbnb is helping me to be those things that I am when I volunteer for the community. So what I'm coming before you to ask is for a one year exemption for us and our single unit for uh, chapter 100. And uh, you know, I understand that this is a law that you guys have passed and you know, I don't wanna fight it, but I do believe 
that uh, there is room for us um, as an unintended consequence to have a, a grace period with which to use this income to help cover the financial commitments that we started before COVID and before this chapter um, came <coughs> forward and also to help us uh, uh, to recover from the losses that we saw in our business from COVID. So that is my ask. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. My first question, Dave, is what portion of chapter 100 are you seeking relief from? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yes. What portion of chapter 100 are you seeking relief from? Well, um, Marie, as you know, we're, we're not even eligible for, to apply uh, because our business is owned by an LLC and um, is, is not owner occupied. So, you know, we're offering, I'm asking for one year relief from the whole thing. I'm asking, and, and I'll say, if I have to apply for a temporary change of use, or if I have to um, come forward to pay some sort of permit, but I'm asking for a relief, uh, for a one year relief from, from the chapter in and of itself. I'm sorry, you, you, you can't, it, it seems to me that, that granting the relief from the chapter as a whole is not something that we should do. If you're seeking relief from a specific portion of the chapter, I'd like to understand what that is, because then we can weigh the relief that you're seeking against how that would affect other people who might seek similar relief. Um, and, and, and by the way, the current code, the current chapter 134 on the books before chapter 100 was, was adopted, did not permit Airbnbs in, on anything other than a state road. So um, it, it, prior to chapter 100, it would have been, let me use the word illegal for you to have a BNB and b on Main Street. Um, okay, so I guess I would say three things. Uh, the first one would be my understanding was that uh, the exceptions to that were um, Main Street and Route 9D because those were the two roads. I thought- Sorry, sorry. 301 ends at Chestnut Street and Morris Avenue. 301 does not continue down Main Street. Okay, so, um, you know, I guess part of what I've come forward to say is that, uh, you know, we, we were never going to do that. We would never put ourselves in that situation. But I, I think one thing that happened during the pandemic that happened everywhere was that things were, were loosened up, you know? I mean, the, the manner with which you would uh, be able to buy a drink in, in a restaurant and drive it to, and take it to go, you know, a lot of things had changed. And, and we, would, we only opened our Airbnb out of necessity. Our backs were to the wall. And, and also it was something that was a widely practiced in the, in the village. So we felt if everyone was doing it, we would do it because you know we felt like we really had no other choice. So yes, I do acknowledge that um, you know I didn't come forward to get the proper paperwork and ask for permission, but you know I'm asking for that now, and I'm saying that you know I'm willing to do whatever I need to do, but um, you know in our personal situation, um, you, you know we we just need a little more help. So I'm just coming. Um, I guess that's the nature of relief. I'm asking for relief from this bill in order to be able to get my affairs in order. Dave. Yes. Sorry, Marie. Marie, I, we can't hear you, Marie. Oh, sorry. Again, you're asking that the Village Board allow you to operate for a year because you've had financial difficulties. I can see a number of other people lining up behind you saying, Dave got it. I want it. And, if, and Marie, if I may say, personally, first of all, I'm the only one here. So you guys wrote that in there and I'm the only one that came. I called Jeff and said, what's the procedure for that? And he said, I don't know. You're the first one to call. So I'm, I'm the only one here asking. And, and second, you know, I would ask, 
what's so wrong with that? What's so wrong with other people who are in a situation they weren't hoping to be in, who are affected by the pandemic, who ha are faced with the new law, but also the realities of their own financial situation? What's so wrong with giving some exception to a few community members with the understanding that the tide is coming in and this is people's chance to uh, get, get their, for community members, contributing community members like myself to get their affairs in order uh, in time for, for this law to catch up to them. I, I think that, I think the problem that I have is, it, and the reason why, be, before we talk about COVID and people's, you know, personal, you know, investments, uh, you know, I, I think one of the main problems and it's been that the law tries to mitigate um, with short term rentals is the having a non, you know, non hosted residents and and not having businesses use use their, uh, you know, use their pro properties as 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 revenue streams. Um, and I think that was one of the, the main things that I think has always been addressed on on all of the all of the codes that I've looked at, you know, from other municipalities, that was a concern so that people don't just come into the village, they don't buy a building, they don't use it, you know, for short term rental when they don't live there. And, you know, so, but then, you know, so COVID comes along and it's like, if, if we grant this, I mean, pretty much it's, 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 it'll set a precedent and nobody's here right now. That's, that's true. Obviously that's true. Um, but uh, it, there is no way that we would have a, a code that would be effective if we grant you this because everyone will say the same exact thing. We have a hardship. We have invested, you know, people say I invested, I put all this money into, even though it was illegal, I put all my money into furniture. I put money into painting my building. I did all this work on the outside and then COVID came, you know, and my investments now, you know, aren't working out. So, you know, um, I guess the question is like, where would this end? And I think we would pretty much have to give, we pretty much just have to say everyone that has an Airbnb would be able to continue having an Airbnb. Uh, you know, that's, the second is this, is that it, it is a business and it is an investment and people invest and they, they I, that's, that's the way our capitalist world works, where, you know, you have properties, you have more than one property um, that you're investing in and renting and you're renting this. I don't know how many, how many units do you rent in this or why they can't be filled now as they were before. Um, but, you know, it's an investment and now we're subsidizing businesses, in, in my view. I, I have some. Go ahead, Dave. Thank, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I, I was in a few different uh, things I would say in response to that. First, you know, I, I wouldn't agree that the village is, is subsidizing a, bill, a business. Um, you know, for you to be subsidizing, you would have to, to be spending money on it to, for, for me to be able to do my business, where in reality, it, it's people who come to stay that are paying the money. So I don't feel like that's really accurate. But, you know, I also want to say that. Um, you know, it seems like the, the answer is, well, where does it stop? But for me, I sort of see this like, this is, this is a new law. So um, where does it stop? I, I feel like, you know, I don't live in the village, but I still feel like I'm, I'm one of the village constituents because, you know, we have a business in the village and my family pays taxes on the, the property. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, we are still constituents and other people who do live in the village that may come forward, you know, they're your constituents too. And, you know, a lot happened. And if you read this law, you would never know that it happened during COVID times because that's not reflected in there. But COVID was an extraordinary circumstance, one different from anything that anyone, any of us have ever experienced in, in my imagination, uh, you know? And so I think that, some exception does deserve to be made. And I get what you're saying, Dave, you know, um, uh, on a blank slate, every part of what you're saying, well, if we make an exception for a rule, but I, I do think that COVID has to come into play somewhere here. It was a massive, massive event that affected everybody's lives. And if you had a business where you were an essential worker or a restaurant, you never stopped working. But if you had a business where you were a yoga studio, you were told to stop and you were the last ones 
where people would come back. And even to, to come back was in 30% capacity with masks on, and no one wants to go inside and do yoga in the heat with a mask on. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, I can't answer you where would it stop, but I don't know that that is a question that needs to be answered because the people that are renting are your constituents too. And if they come forward asking for help in this limited time period, I can't understand how it would benefit the village to say no to its constituents that are asking for a short time window of relief from this rule. I mean, it says in there, if you need relief, come forward to ask for relief. And, and my relief is based solely on, on uh, forces that are outside my control, um, the reasons why I need relief. So I'm just here saying, you know, can I have help from this village that I belong to, that I take part in, that I volunteer in, that I, I put my heart and soul in? And when you say like, where does it stop? Well, where does it stop for people to come to protest the law in the first place? I only saw three or four people come forward each one of those times. So how many people are invested to come to the meetings for this? It didn't seem like that many back then. So who, I, who's to predict that it'll be that many in the future? So to say no to, to my request, based on the theoretical idea that more people may come forward, seems like um, you know a, a bit short-sighted in terms of trying to help a community member that's just coming forward and asking for the relief that, that uh, you know, you've called for me to have the right to come request. So you know, quite simply, I'm, I'm just coming as a, as a community member asking for your help. Fran? I, I would say that, that calling it short-sighted when, when what precedents are sent is, is not accurate. I, I think if you talk to any attorney when you're doing anything, one of the things that comes up is when you're when you're, you know, putting a law into place or policy is the precedent that it'll set. So you know, for I think actually it's not short-sighted. In fact, I think it's the long view on this is what can and will happen, and and I guarantee you will happen. I know it will happen. And, you know, I, we don't know how many people are going to uh, to apply for the short term rentals. We do know that there will be people that have advocated for not doing it all. And I'm sure that they're organizing and that they will sue the village. So um, I will also put money on that one. So, you know, it's definitely not short sighted. I, I think actually it's actually a responsible way to uh, to listen to your your argument on, on relief. Well, Dave, uh, I apologize for using the word short sighted. Um, if, if that offended you, I, I will take it back. I meant um, more in my case and more in the case of people that need help. Um, you know, per perhaps short-sighted isn't the proper term. Maybe, I, I guess, um, you know, a, a lack of, of concern for, for people on an individual level is more what I meant to say. And I don't mean to accuse you of having a lack of concern for people on, on an individual level, but in some ways I feel like this law um, doesn't uh, uh, recognize people who have suffered during these difficult times. And they have been difficult times and did more difficult for my industry than, than almost any. So um, you know, my apologies for using the word short-sighted. Um, I take that back. Let me jump in here for a second, Dave, a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned that um, <clears throat> this law was written during COVID and it doesn't take that into effect or you can't write laws based on um, like a pandemic that's just you know happening and coming and going. Okay, so that that being said, you're asking for a one year exemption. Um, a one year exemption meaning what? Do you want to rent for a whole year? Do you want? I mean, because according to the chapter 100, you can rent for no more than 90 days in a calendar year. Are you asking for an exemption because you're not a hosted short term rental? or do you want to be unhosted? Um, the chapter says 90 days. Are you asking to rent more than 90 days? And if you're asking to rent for a whole year, why don't you rent the apartment for a year? Just go out and, and rent it for a year. Give somebody a one-year lease with the understanding that, you know, at the end of the lease, it's not necessarily going to be renewed. Um, the chapter limits you to 90 days. So if we gave you a one-year exemption, which would basically, in my mind, mean <clears throat> you can apply for a permit for a year, but that gives you no more than 90 days to rent your space and no more than a uh, maximum of 29 days each time. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what you're really asking here. Uh, I know you're not a hosted uh, property. Uh, unhosted properties are 
are a little bit on uh, what we have the last numbers of them, but still it's 90 days. So I'm not sure if you're asking for us to give you a one year exemption to my mind, it's like put your property on the market and rent it for a year uh, with a one year lease to somebody. Cause you, even with this, with this chapter, you can't rent for more than 90 days. So I'm not sure what exemption you're asking for here. Are there, are there multiple exemptions within the code? So you would have to sort of specify exactly what you're asking for. Um, so that was, as you're running through, you know, that's what came to my mind. I mean, at the most, according to what we see now, 90 days is your limit if we do allow you to get a permit and if we allow you to get a permit as a hosted when you're unhosted um, or whatever. Um, so that's, unless you're asking for something other than that, are you asking us to allow you to short-term rental all year? You said you didn't want to do it all the time. You said you just want to do it a couple of times. So I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're asking and whether or not, you know, that is, I mean, I understand your situation. I just don't know what the, what the uh, ask is at this point. Right. And, and what I would add to that is immediately yeah. when I look at the law, you're, you're not owner occupied. And so that to me just knocks you right out. And right, if, so you're, if you're asking for relief from owner occupied, that's a big ask, huge. So, uh, well, even if you were to give me relief from owner occupied, I would still be ineligible because my building is owned by an LLC. So, no, 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 no. If, if you have 50% ownership, LLCs are permitted. So, um, we're not owner occupied. I feel like we are business owner occupied, which obviously does not fit the definition. But, you know, it, it, it's very similar because the people walk by our business every day to, to if they go to, to an Airbnb. So, um, yes, to answer your question, Fran, uh, what, what I was coming forward to ask for was uh, for a one year grace period to be able to continue to run our Airbnb and we would come forward to get whatever permits are required or whatever approvals or um, inspections uh, we needed. But, um, you know, that was the request. Uh, and I based that up. Uh, on how much money we lost during the pandemic and uh, what commitments we feel and how much we think we can make during the Airbnb. And uh, in answer to your question, why wouldn't we just rent it? Um, you know, uh, the, the answer is because, you know, we, we want to turn it back. We don't want to write a one-year lease for someone. We eventually hope to get it back to, to a yoga studio, but we're also hoping to be able to rent it as an Airbnb because there's much more potential for revenue if you're doing short-term rental as opposed to a year rental. And that would help us to return it to the purpose that we originally wanted it to be in the first place. Um, and uh, you know, I'm asking for a year of relief from this chapter. Uh, and um, so, so a year of relief, meaning you understand that you cannot short-term rental it for more than 90 days. Or are you asking for more than that? Um, because the chapter only allows 90 days to anyone. For hosted, you mean? Hosted or unhosted. I mean, my, my intention was to come and ask for relief from it entirely, but I, I would take what I could get at this point. You know, I wanna be able to, um, you know, help to, you know, correct my course as best as possible. So I don't know if you guys, want to talk about it on the, or if you if you already know how you feel but um you know I'll, I'll take what i can get i came here to ask for um, a one-year exception to this policy uh that i would be able to rent unlimited for, for one year uh, because that's what i think i need to get back to where i was before the pandemic but um you know it's not up to me but that that was my ask when i came forward I guess to go back to my original thinking is that the, what I have a problem with is this is this is this is a business, um, it's an investment, um, and uh, yes, there's hardships and there's setbacks um, to be considered. Uh, but then you know I just hear you saying that you you know you can't rent out because there's more the possibility for more profit or more revenue coming in if you do one way or the other. So it, it seems like it's you know I I just have a hard time 
um, since, it, since it's a business. It's not, you know, it, it's an investment. It's a huge, one of the most beautiful buildings on Main Street. You have a number of rentals that are being, that are, that are full. I don't know what the rest of your uh, situation is and how many rentals are still, you know, unfilled or if you want to make those into also, you know, it would seem like where does this stop also with you? I mean, is there other places and apartments that can be made into Airbnbs on other floors and other areas of the buildings? And then the reason for that would be because you're still trying to make ends meet. Um, you know, I, that, I, that's where I, do, I just have my problem. It's not like an individual, if you're having, if you're in a house and you're renting it and uh, you're trying to like hang on to that, but it's like with multiple properties and, you know, investments that it just puts a different light on it for me. Yeah, I get that. that? And, um, hold on. and, and uh, I guess what, what I'll say is, um, you know, obviously it's not my choice, but when I'm faced with the choice, a lot of times what I look at is like, what's the worst that can happen in, in both ends? And I feel like, you know, you're saying, well, if you, if we give you relief and other people come forward for relief, then we're going to be giving a bunch of other people relief. And I try and imagine, you know, 10 years from now, um, you know, this law is still in place and uh, the things that you wanted to save the village from, you have saved it from. But at the same time, what is the harm in giving the relief to say the five or the 10 or the 12 or the 15 people that came and said, hey, I'm in a tough spot. Can you help me out? I'm your community member. I get what you're trying to do. I just need a little time to be able to comply. And so, you know, I want to do, uh, I, you know, I want to come and ask you if, if I can have that time. And I know uh, uh, other people are planning on doing things different ways. And, and this is how I want to do it by asking you guys if you can consider. And yes, Dave, I, we do have other properties and, and some we rent, um, you know, we have a property that we're renting on Lane Gate Road to someone who's a permanent resident. And, you know, I could ask them to leave and try to make that an Airbnb, but I want to give that place to that person who's been there for a long time. And I know that, that they want to stay in this community, but at the same time, nobody's here. The yoga studio, you know, we're not quite ready to reopen. We want to, but, you know, we just want a little more time to, to like I keep saying, get our affairs in order um, financially before, you know, we accept or we comply with the rising tide of, of this chapter 100. Um, so I just think you know, that yeah, where you say where this is end is, I can see, I, and if we allow this, I, I just can see anyone, anytime, anywhere in the future, making the same exact argument it is you're making. They can't add COVID to it, but they can say, I, I just can't make ends meet. I can't make ends meet without this property. And if I, you know, so I need relief from that. You know, I am retired. Uh, this is the only money I have, or this is just what I have. Or maybe, you know, I like supplementing this because I want to go on vacations or I want to buy a new car. And this, this gives me that possibility. It's like, you know, where does that end? I just see the future. Anybody would be able to use the same argument you're using and justifiably. I mean, they could, I, it would be the same thing to me. Agreed, except for this is a new law. So you, this is a new law. You guys just passed it. You offered this uh, a, a request to ask for relief. So I came to ask for relief to this new law. So five years from now, when someone says, hey, I want to go on vacation, hey, I have hardship, hey, I lost my job. It's not a little new law anymore. And properties change hands. And as new people take over new properties, these laws are still in effect. And, and, and they know that from the start. So, um, you know, I, I feel like that's why it is appropriate now, because this is new and I'm coming to ask for it as it's passed. And years from now, you know, it will have been standing, but now it's fresh and, and, and its effect on me and my family and our business is fresh. And so I'm coming, you know, as this comes out, as the ink isn't even still dry on it, to ask for some relief in order to be able to be in a position to comply down the road. So can I, let, let me ask you or put a question to you because you mentioned your other rental that you rent that out to someone and you like them or whatever. So as a person that's trying to make ends meet, you're trying to scrap it together, you're giving us a hardship case, you know, where you're, you know, just, you know, barely surviving or whatever, or that's the way it sounds. And, and you have a property that you could rent as an Airbnb, but you're renting it full time. As an Airbnb from everything I've seen, you can, and I actually rented my house just for a short period for circumstances. You can make double at least what you're what you're making from a rental, you know, for 
you know, for a monthly rental, I mean, for a yearly rental versus Airbnb. So why wouldn't you do that if, if you're in such a circumstance that you need to make ends meet? And why, when you can make double the money by doing that, or you could rent out your apartment on the top floor of where the studio is full time right now, you could have put that on the market to, to, be, to be rented and, and you haven't done that. So you know, as a business, again, I, I have a problem understanding, you know, it seems like those are things you believe in. Uh, well, I like these people so they can stay here. But then you're coming to us and saying, I can't make ends meet. I need this release. OK, so I'm glad you asked that question. And uh, here's my answer, because in the house next that I rent um, that's not in the village, someone lives there. A mother lives there with her children. And I feel responsible for her. And she lost a job during COVID. And I felt responsible to make sure as a tenant, as someone in my care, that I would take care of, of these tenants and make sure that they were that, that 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 I wasn't the reason for their hardship. You know, I made sure no matter what, this is a person who lives there with, with their children. And to me, that means something. I feel like I'm responsible because they're in my care and I don't want to have them experience greater hardship. Um, and so if they left, maybe I would do that, but I'm not gonna put them on the street because that's where they have put lay their head at night. On the other hand, the Airbnb, I don't have to kick anybody out or the one in the village. So it, here's just an opportunity where I'm not putting anyone out as opposed to um, not taking an opportunity to uh, give someone else hardship that I feel like I'm responsible for. Just as I'm saying, you know, I feel like you guys are in ways responsible for, for for us as building owners and business owners in the town and and we're asking you for help you know just like if i went to my tenant and said you know you're out i'm going to airbnb it they would ask me for help you know it, it you know that's the simple answer i just wanted to do what's right by as many people and i see my airbnb in the village as as you know really having almost no negative consequence to anyone uh, whereas I can see moving in that other direction would have potentially devastating effects on someone else's life. So um, I wouldn't know how to answer it other than that. So I keep coming back to you. You wish to get relief. You wish to get relief from a number of uh, elements in the law. Is that correct? I mean, my intention was to ask for relief from the law, but if I can't have that. In total, okay. So, but if I look at the law, what are the specific elements of the law for which you're asking relief? I think what David's asking, if I might interject, is that he would like to have no laws on his apartment for the entire year. Is that right, David? You would like to be able to rent your apartment as often as you want and, and it's for, for a full year so that you can be back on track. That is my ask. And if you felt uh, that you would give me a shorter period, I would take it. And, you know, uh, I mean, I'm subject to accept whatever you guys decide. But yeah, that's my ask. Uh, um, to have a year of, of exemption from this law with the understanding that, um, you know, it is what it is. And in the future, I would have to figure out how to, how to not be in violation and to comply. I'm not attacked. I mean, you know, I came up with that time uh, period based on, you know, accounting uh, and, and my situation. But, you know. Um, yeah, unfortunately, if we gave you exemption from this law, going back to what Marie said earlier, you would be bound by the law that says that you cannot have a short term rental on Main Street, or the original law says there were no short-term rentals in B districts, right, B1 districts. So you'd be bound by that. Um, you know, so, um, I mean, I, I'm interested in, in parts of it. Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I would like to think this through before we just give an answer tonight, but I mean. Well, I'm grateful for that, Fran, thank you. And just I'd be happy to. I haven't, haven't heard from you. Do you have thoughts on this? Did you say my name, Dave? Yes. Um, if you had thoughts on this, I haven't heard. You, I, while you were while you were all talking, I went back and and read the chapter again, and I think 
you know, we were one of the primary intents of the law was to avoid the circumstance in which properties were purchased by LLCs that were not owner occupied. So we would, so that we would be um, having ghost, ghost houses, if you will, without residents um, on the property. And I think that the scenario you're describing is that scenario, right? You are, you are a, I don't know what percentage owner you are in your, in your LLC, but the building is owned by an LLC and you don't occupy it. And that's the scenario we're trying to avoid. So whether asking for an exemption from that creates a situation, creates a circumstance that we are, that we are we're attempting to regulate. The, and the, the day restriction, right? We're trying to, we're trying to limit the impact of, M, of STRs. And to Fran's point, you do have the option for a full year, a full year rental. I think the key element here is that the law doesn't restrict you from um, making a reasonable return on your building, right? It, it may restrict you from what you feel is the highest and best use of that structure with an STR, but we're balancing your, your, we're balancing the opportunity for highest and best use against the greater good. And in this case, you know, I think what, what the, the goal we were trying to get to was owner occupied and managed um, short-term rentals. And where we're trying to get away, we're trying to avoid LLCs with non-residency turning properties into short-term rentals. So if, if you were, you might have more of a case if you didn't have any other capacity for income, you might be able to make a hardship case, but I think that you do still have a reasonable return on your property. So I don't see that argument either. I think this is exact. This is exa almost exactly the scenario that we're that we were trying to regulate and pre and prevent. Uh, which is why you know I'm coming forward asking for my exemption to have a, a finite time period. I would say I, I disagree with you um, very much. So in your idea that this is the quote unquote ghost house, because while it fits the definition of not being residentially occupied, it is certainly anything but ghost managed. I mean, we are there every oh, day. Absolutely. I'm there every day. And my wife's business, she's there seven days a week. She's there more than she's home. So the idea that she is, that we're not there, that it's a ghost uh, managed house it is really not accurate to what we're doing because while we're not residentially occupied, we are business occupied. I know that doesn't meet the definition, but for us, um, you know, I don't think anything that definition is trying to accomplish, we fall outside the scope of uh, so, given our involvement in the building. So, cur so currently that, that consideration isn't in the code for um, a commercial building in which the owner of the building is operates on the site of the commercial building. That's currently not in the scope. And that sounds like something that you might propose as an alternative, but it is not available at this time. And I don't think that an exemption, that to me sounds like a structural, a structural change in the code and not an exemption. I, I do agree with my colleagues that exemptions are a slippery slope and I, I don't know reasonably where you draw a line if you if we were to say yes to this request I think the the more reasonable approach is um, you know making a proposal that considers a definition of what that might be and putting that that idea forward um, I think also I think it's important I think that uh Trustee Foley uh, hit it on the head as far as returns go, and and what you what's a reasonable return, and what is you know a, a, you know maybe a premium return, um, and you are you are able to rent rent these spaces out now. You are able to turn it into a uh, to a bed and breakfast if you'd like, um, if you wanted to go even further down that road. Um, 
So, you know, you know, it seems like you'd like to have it as Airbnb because then you can still keep it as a studio and then you can, you know, profit from that all, which, which is fine. And I'm not a good, good for you. I, I just, you know, I'm having a hard time, you know, for, with the hardship case also in, in, in the situation when you do have, uh, you know, you do have options, which you don't seem willing to take, want to be able to take advantage of. Um, you know, in terms of premium return, um, versus uh, re regular return. You know, we were um, in a period of having regular return and then COVID came and we saw in most of the units, zero return. So now we're hoping to have premium return in order to catch up from the zero return from COVID. And, you know, that's why I'm trying to, you know, put a time limit on it so that, you know, when we can get it back together, um, you know, we will uh, be in a position to, you know, to, com to comply. And, you know, I'm not looking for forgiveness, you know, I'm coming for permission because, you know, I think that as a community member, um, you, you know, and someone who, who read, you know, to come forward for relief, you know, quite simply put, that, that's what I'm asking for. And, uh, you, you know, like I said, we're not trying to be in every, every uh, a bed and breakfast or to change what we're doing altogether. We're just trying to get back to the status quo that we were before COVID, which is you know a, a global pandemic, a, a, a tragic event that affected everybody, and this is how we're hoping to to you know get back to normalcy. That's all. Can I make a suggestion to you that is not it's not the answer that you're looking for, but it but it may be something to explore. So the the COVID relief that came to counties and municipalities can be used in uh, limited ways. One of the ways is for individual and commercial losses. The village, we, we received comparatively a small amount. Among the categories that it that that relief money can be used for is water and sewer. And we have some desperate needs and that's probably where that money, I think it's safe to say that's probably where our small chunk will go. The town and the county got much higher amounts. The county got 19 million. I think the town got what, 700,000? Is that the number? Does anyone know? The town got much more and they're in conversations and, and as is Nelsonville about whether it makes sense to use some of those funds for personal household relief and commercial relief. So that may be a conversation that you might want to have at the town level as they're considering dividing up their larger pie. Okay. Now that's, that's specifically COVID relief as opposed to relief, relief from, a, from, a, from a local law. Also, I think one other important thing is that, you know, like I've had conversations with other folks that have, uh, you know, and uh, heated exchanges actually um, with one person that, you know, runs a, and, and arguably he runs a very good uh, Airbnb. Um, and, but it's like, I don't think you can make a law or, you know, craft a law because someone abides by something or someone has this, you know, perfect, world Airbnb or that you, you know, are, you know, you're not owner occupied, but, you know, you have someone there all the time or different circumstances. That's, that's incredibly hard to do. I mean, basically, you know, th that's, that's great. I'm glad people, you know, run a good Airbnb, but that shouldn't, you know, they should still have to, you know, follow the law. And, uh, you know, we can't make a law that goes, you know, that is especially just for one individual or, you know, here and, and not everyone else. So like giving you relief for this, you know, and as, as this is an investment pro property and, or just, I, there's, as I said a number of times and I, and I won't say it again, is uh, I just think there'll be no end of it. There's no way that we'd be, it would set a precedent and there would be no way we could stop anybody from doing this, you know, or coming for the, with the same request. And I, you know, I'll, I'll say for the last time, and my response to that is simply, this is a new law, <coughs> COVID just happened. 
This isn't always going to be a new law. COVID, we're not always going to be just overcoming the COVID pandemic. That's just as relates to right now. And we saw how few people came forward to protest the law in the first place. And so if, if some of the community members, some of the people, some of your constituents do come forward and ask for temporary relief in order for them to figure out their next moves, retired people or people that are, are you know, have come for one reason or another to depend on, uh, uh, on their Airbnb, giving them, your constituents, a grace period with which to position themselves to be able to survive and yet you know, their business survived, their household survived, and to be in compliance with this in the future. I just don't see, you know, I get when does it end, but it ends when we're not, when this isn't a brand new law and we're not just overcoming COVID. If a couple so what happens, COVID, David, what happens if, uh, you know, say there's COVID, this, this is an investment, this is your business, this is what you're putting your life into. So what happens when stock markets go down or what happens when people decide Cold Spring's not a hit place or what happens, you know, there's like I, probably an endless uh, number of scenarios that would affect your investments and is the village or who's responsible for that. This is your investment. You've invested in this and then COVID came along. I mean, I, you know, and, and you can, st and no one's stopping you from making a return on anything that you have. And there is ways and options for you. It's, it's just, I have a really hard time with a business. Like, it's not like a personal, like, you know, someone that's, uh, you know, like you had mentioned, maybe someone is living on social security and they have a, uh, you know, next, yeah, they have a room they like to rent out, you know, and if they can't rent that out, they can't stay in the house they've been in for 40 years. That would be something I'd consider, you know, but, you know, when, when you have, a, I have you know, I'm speaking, please, just just for a minute and then be willing to hear everything you have to say. I, I just, you know, I, I think it's different. Um, you know, when you're talking about a business that has a number of investments that you, to you, you know, that you've worked on and uh, and you've done a great job. You uh, have a number of houses. I don't know whether they're totally owned by you or who. You're building a house or just built a house during COVID at the height of building material, the cost of building materials. Right. Why did you yeah. do that? Why not stop doing that? Why, did, why couldn't you just not? It's not my, I don't, I don't care. It's not, I don't need to know that, but it just seems point. why you would continue during That's COVID to build a house. Listen. You can't stop once a house is delivered. Well, I, what would you do if you're if, if, you, if you? But aside from all of this, my investment, our investment, is in this village, is in this community. There are a lot of assumptions here, and I have 18 employees. Just like Dave says, you know, we're not going to kick somebody out of the house. I felt a responsibility to those individuals. I still feel a responsibility to those individuals, those people who have also built businesses in this community. So why don't I want to just rent that place? Because I've spent 18 years building a business alongside a lot of other amazing, incredible, wonderful people, two of which could not put food on their table for Thanksgiving. Other teachers who lost their spouses during that. So you know, there's a lot of assumptions about who we are or what we have. I'm wondering really what that piece was put in for with hardship. Malia, well, did you apply what you for PPP? Need, what evidence do you need to understand? Because I can tell you, listening to you all speak, that you really don't understand what we have been through or what has happened here or what my teachers have been through or what we've tried to endure. So saying that, oh, well, you know, you can just rent it out. I can just give up 18 years, the 18 employees that I've worked with. I can just give up trying to continue to add to my community in a meaningful way. Would I know that none for... of you have been to my business here, except for, you know, Kathleen has been there. So maybe you don't have a real connection. Malia, did you apply what? for a Putnam County Business Council has put out mm -hmm. constantly different ways that you can apply for sorry, PPP? Friend, I you I'm sorry? Uh, yes, yes, okay. of course. Friend. I mean, you have of 18 course. employees, I... you should have been able to apply for, for assistance to pay them, to continue to pay them. Yes, and so that lasts for two months. All of my employees got paid. We did not get paid. 
we could not continue to pay. We had to borrow money to pay. So yeah, we did. And then Cuomo, I mean, we weren't able to open for nine months. And my business is one of those businesses that is not coming back the way that it came back. So you do have to reorganize and you do have to figure these things out. And I have kept my teachers working. I have kept them employed. I have kept them being paid and fed. That's important. That's an important part. That does matter. Seems to me we, we've been going over the same points over and over again. And I think we've spent at least a half an hour on this thus far. I don't know that that further discussion is going to be very productive, in my, my, my opinion. No, I, 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 I would agree with you, Marie. I don't think that there, there is space. You know, I'm not really sure what that meant when, when you all wrote that, if there's not any guidelines around that, right? It's just assumptions. I don't know what you, what you mean by assumptions. Could you explain? Well, when you mention, you know, if you're on vacation or you've said several times, like you're, you know, it's just a certain quality of living or it's all of these things. I, 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 I understand that there are, there are assumptions here and that, you know. I, when I was, when I, just to be clear, when I was talking about that, I wasn't, wasn't talking about you or you going on vacation or whatever. I was, we were talking about different scenarios and where this might right. take place. And what I was saying is there is a difference between, you know, folks that, as I gave in as an example, someone living on social security, maybe a single person, maybe their husband or wife just died and they have a house and they have a room. I think the exemption might work for that because they need that because that is their last hope and that's how they're barely getting by. And, and, you know, and then there are other people that, you know, have a number of rentals and I'm not, and this isn't you either, but that, you know, they aren't in that need. They're not in that category and it's a lucrative business. Short-term rentals is lucrative. And, and we wrote this law as Kathleen pointed out to stop investments and, and to, to keep a, a character um, of the village. And maybe you are not in violation of that, certainly not, but we can't write a law around you. I, I mean, we just can't say, you know, there's laws here and we'll carve that out for this individual because we know them because they're productive people, uh, they, you know, they work with us or, uh, you know, with the uh, community. You, you just can't do that. Okay, so my question is, what are the ways through besides you just- You guys are frozen. Yeah, the, connect, the connection is breaking up. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you, I can't hear Dave Mirandi. Right, I think we lost Dave. Okay. Dave froze. Um, oh, no. That was a very convenient freeze, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I do wanna say uh, in response to what he said, you know, oh, there he is, Mr. Mayor. Hi. Pretty oh, yes, you, you can still hear me apparently. So uh, <laughs> yes, Dave, you've known me a long time. Our families have been friends since as long as I can remember, obviously, and, and obviously we'll still continue to be so. And you know, when you say that, like if you're on social security, maybe there would uh, be reason for this. But I do want to tell you that um, you can consider us and what you know about us, but we kept all of our employees employed. And uh, what you're saying, like that hardship, maybe if you were one of those people in this circumstance, you know, we're trying to save our business, obviously. Um, but, you know, we do have employees that we're paying that we haven't stopped paying that we've continued to pay that are in the exact situation that you're talking about, that are, um, you, you know, they do need the money that our business generates in order to keep going. And a lot of what we've been paying them with, frankly, has been the Airbnb money. So we're taking it in and we're using it to keep Malia's employees employed while they're not working. So, you know, we, we just want to get on the right side of the ledger, that's all. And, you know, yes, we're not on social security, but I can promise you that, you know, uh, 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 teachers of Malia's lost their spouses, multiple teachers of Malia's and, and uh, you know, we care about that. And, and a part of what we're, we, our commitment is to helping to support those people too. So. You know, Marie, I will agree. We're, we're going to just go around forever. And knowing me and Dave, we could both, you know, keep trying to get the next word until morning. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if there's going to be fresh questions, but I, I feel like we know where you stand. I feel like you, you know where, where, where we stand. 
and uh, I don't know um, if you guys want to talk about it separately or, or tell us how you feel now, but uh, either way, I, I appreciate, um, you know, that you've heard us. And, and I would say just one last time, uh, you know, echoing what Malia said, you know, putting in there anyone who's seeking relief, you know, you say a lot of times we can't make an exception because then where the exceptions stop. But in the law, you say anyone who needs to be an exception, come forward and tell us why you need to be an exception. So we're merely doing that. We're stating our case. It's our case. And it's the case of the people that rely on us. And, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know what else more to say. I'm already losing my voice. But uh, thank you for hearing us. And, and I appreciate the time. I know that we uh, went even longer than uh, than the rec department. So uh, I guess <laughs> we'll, we'll end it at that. Uh, um, but uh, thank you for hearing us. Thanks for coming, Dave. <laughs> So what happens next? I, I guess I would ask. I'm not. We're not going to make a decision tonight. I I need to think about things. Um, I don't know if anyone else does, unless everyone else is as is willing to wants to vote on on this or not tonight. I'd like to wait. I'd like to think it through. Okay, I I agree. Well, that's better than no. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Dave. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Maria. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Night. Okay, I'm um, sorry, um, I, whatever. Um, so continuing on, uh, next is the, uh, to approve a quote uh, for tough book for a new police vehicle. Um, I, we just have the information in front of us. I know no more about this. Is anyone more keyed in? Yeah. This, is, this is for the new police car. Um, with the issues going on in the supply chain, we just talking to Michelle and with Anthony, we just felt it best to put this forward now and put the order in with the hopes that by the time the car's here, the supply chain will loosen up, we'll be able to get the tough book. Okay. I'll, I'll this money, and this money was already budgeted. Um, it, we've already budgeted for this. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the... Uh the expenditure for this, uh, for the uh, tough book. Second. Any further comments? No. Discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next is request for League of Women Voters to set a voter registration table on Main Street. Do we have a location? I'm sorry, I didn't read this. Visitor. The visitor center. They wanna put a table at the visitor center, Dave. Okay, I'm not sure where that would work. And either, either tomorrow or Thursday for two hours. Yeah. At the end of Main Street, they were looking at. On this, I understood it to be the stone area. Yeah. Okay, it's Wednesday and Thursday, not a problem. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the request uh, by the uh, women, uh, League of Women Voters. For second. second. Second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Let's see, discussion on chapter 134. Marie. Yeah. I sent you all a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet shows the parcels. Sorry. This is this this Zoom is really annoying anymore. <laughs> so I, I sent you all a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet shows all of those parcels right. that would be rezoned. Many of them are I1. Some of them are. Uh, split amongst multiple zones. And what we had originally proposed was that all of the um, marathon properties go from I-1 to MU-1. However, from the conversation with John and Ted last week and the, what the uh, village board agreed upon was to keep them in I-1 and that, that would be rows uh, 23 through row 52. There are some um, at, the, at the bottom from 53 on, that's cleanup. There was never a new zoning map created when B4A was created, um, nor was there a new zoning map created when the three private parcels adjacent to Butterfield were created. So this cleans that up. In addition, the two parcels that 
are adjacent to Wall Street. One fronts on uh, Chestnut Street, one fronts on Wall Street. They are currently zoned B1 and B2. And the proposal is to make them R1. And then we come up to the others. In yellow and blue, you will see the parcels which are currently zoned I1 or I1 and other uh, zones. And the proposal for each of them in column G identifies what zone they would be moved into. Uh, there may be um, a concern about how that was determined. What you can see in the blue is um, a size of the, the lot in question. The 27K is the requirement for an R3 lot, requires 27,000 square feet. Um, and so in that list in the, in the top of 15, well, sorry, top 14 rows, um, only one, two are being proposed to be uh, put into R3. One of those is the sliver of Forge Gate and the other is Three Rock. And then, oh, sorry, Three Rock and Seven Rock. Three Rock and Seven Rock are currently zoned R3. Uh, given their size, they probably would qualify for R3. The remaining three rows, four rows, properties that are currently zoned R3 and I1 would qualify less, let us say, uh, based upon the size of the, of the houses, the size of the lots. So my proposal for the yellow ones is to move them, currently they're in I1 or I1 and another zone. So the proposal is to move them into R1, R3, PR1, and, and PR1. You'll also see below that um, uh, two lots which are currently zoned recreation. That zoning is going away. And so the, um, those two lots which are rows 20 and 21 are being proposed to be moved to PR1 and to R1. So that, that about covers it. Marie, can you um, take a step back and educate me on process a bit? I will be honest and say that when I looked at the maps previously, my brain did not engage on the re, the potential re zoning of Mayor's Park and Pavilion to MU1, along with the other uses on that parcel, which are highway garage and water treatment plants. It's that eight, eight, eight acre parcel. What is the, what, what, was it a code update recommendation or was it this board's discussion before I came on? How, how did you land on MU1 and, and why not have that be a, a parks and recreation listing in the same way that the rest of Waterfront Park is, Dockside and Waterfront. Which property are you talking about? So it is parcel number. It might be useful to share the screen if I don't know if Jeff is there. 48.8-1-24.1. There had been 24-2, right? So, so there's, that is the parcel that includes 24.1 includes the highway garage, according to your spreadsheet and looking at the, the map that's up, that's up on the website, highway garage, water treatment plant, mayor's park and pavilion. Currently I-1 proposed to MU now discussing going back to I-1 again. But my, my question after having seen this spreadsheet is why is that not parks and recreation? Can't can't hear you, Marie. It's actually a split use. It's partially industrial, 
and partially parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. we, we wouldn't do a split zone. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But so, why, why not? Why is, why was it proposed to go to MU1 at all? Why not leave it just as I want? Because the proposal was to move everything that was in I1 to MU1 with the exception of the parcels on the Boulevard, Mill Avenue, and Rock Street. Okay, but this is none of those. That's correct. That's why it was moved from I1 to MU1. And now the proposal is to move everything back to I1. So, so the logic in getting to MU1 I'm, I'm having, while I understand that there are split uses on the parcel, and I think part of that is that there used to be two parcels, right? There was 24.1 and 24.2. Uh, why you wouldn't make the whole thing PR, Parks and Recreation? I mean, it's, the point is kind of, I guess the point is moot now because under, under the current proposal, it goes back to IU1, which accommodates the sewer treatment plant and the highway garage, but you do still have this parks and recreation use on the majority of the site. This was, this was can I jump in for a second? This was please, please do. done at the code update committee, one of those meetings that they had in the firehouse about three or four years ago uh, when they did all of this. So this came um, as recommendations, I believe, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, from the code update committee, all of these adjustments and the new, the new zoning. Uh, is that correct, Murray? Yes. Um, is it possible for a, a constituent to speak? Or is that at the end of your meeting? Uh, I'll just hold off for a minute, Paul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. any, Marie or Fran, do you want to elaborate on that? Or Paul was part of the committee? So Yes, Paul, I, I can't remember whether Paul was on the committee at that time. But I certainly really, was. But it really doesn't, doesn't matter. The, the choices, everything in I-1 was originally proposed to go to MU-1. And, and I would differ with that. I, I, I wasn't there, so I'm staying out of this one. I, I was. So go ahead, Paul, explain. Well, I'm, I'm here because I read the article in the, in the current. And I'm concerned, that caused me some concern about the direction this has taken because having invested a considerable amount of time in discussion about these things, um, this is not what was intended. So my recollection in this about this specific property now that it's come up um, is that we had at the, at the north end of this, we had a park and recreation segment. And I remember from the map that we showed in that public hearing, those public hearings, that was always the case. That the, at the north end, the more northernmost end was park, parks and recreation. So I don't know what happened to that because what I'm hearing is that the whole thing, according to this spreadsheet, which I haven't had the benefit of seeing, but according to this spreadsheet, apparently the whole thing is being proposed, not just as MU1, which, is, which we talked about, the southern part of it, but at the same time that it's now going back to I1 is, is nothing short for me of alarming. Can we share, are we able to share the screen? It is being shared. It is shared. Is the audio, oh, okay. I mean, the map that we, is it possible for you, is it possible for you to show the map that, that we showed during the, during the uh, presentations? It's public record, right? That's the one I, that's the one I recall, because I remember, I made the map, so I remember what we did. Um, it took me a few minutes but as it turns out, the property should only be in one zone. Say that again. A property should only be in one zone. That's that's not what we proposed. We we understood that 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 there was property at the north end that was the park. That is where the the um, bands or not the bandstand, but where where the pavilion is. At the north end of the park on our map, we had that as, as PR1. And no, as yes, Parks and Recreation 1, that's right. So I would like you to at least look at that map and remember what it was that we proposed. 
So that's one point. The other point, though, is about this proposal to, to keep it I-1. Uh, makes absolutely no sense to me after the hours and hours of discussion we went through about what this should become and why. So I, I'm just shocked. So that's why I'm tuning in. And I'm sorry that I'm coming to it so late because I, I'm just alarmed that this is happening. So uh, the last meeting that we had, uh, sorry, the first public meeting that we had on 134, there were issues, concerns raised by uh, two residents that by implementing ME1, the village did not um, retain leverage. And that was the word that was used by both um, commenters. So the second that me meeting that we had in the continuation of 134, uh, we invited our uh, council and Ted Fink to the meeting. And both of them recommended that instead of going forward with MU1, that the village consider implementing floating zones. And so that is the direction that the village is going in now, where a floating zone would be defined as, as a zone which would not land on any specific parcel or parcels, but would be a concept that would have in its standards that at some point after the implementation of floating zones, a developer can come forward to the village and request that their property fall under the floating zones. At that point, the developer would then begin working with either the village board or the planning board to describe in detail how their property would fit into or adhere to the standards that were defined in the floating zone. And the recommendation from Ted Fink and um, John First was to revert back to I-1. Here's As, the problem, oh, sorry, Marie. Well, I mean, this, yeah, I mean, I have an issue with that because to me, that is the formula that led us to Butterfield because that was negotiated with the developer to end up with that product. And at the same time, it means that I-1 can be developed exactly as they want to in I-1, which they, they don't have to come to you to ask for this, this uh, PUD, right? They can just develop it as if it's I-1. And that is not what the comp plan says. And that's exactly why we're recommending it to become MU-1. So think, they don't have to come back to you and ask for that. They can just develop it as of right in I-1. And I think the same thing can be said about MU-1, which gives them the same capability. They can do what they want per the law as far as MU-1, the zone that the district will, will allow. They don't have to come to us. So we have no leverage. Well, I think- Leverage, but M M the leverage is, is the district that you're creating of MU-1, which, which is in, I mean, this is back and forth, but it's like this, the whole, the Bible for this thing is the comp plan, right? You got to look at the comp plan. The comp plan says, this is what they're looking for. So we're trying to use that as the, as the, the template for moving forward. IU-1 is definitely not part of the comp plan. Right, that was right. never a part of the complaint to, to retain I I one, or I two for that matter. I mean, I two is like all of the 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 park, all of the um, you know Foundry Park. I mean, it, it just makes no sense to me. This thing, this to me, this opens this opens it up and makes it possible for that developer to do anything they want on that property. That's not true. It has the it, it has the opposite. The opposite accomplishment. Well, we have a planner that's a professional planner. We have an attorney that would disagree with that. And and I would just and I'm I'm not a, a planner and not an attorney, but just from looking at this, I would I would agree, I would disagree with that also. Right now it's I one, it's been I one for how long and nothing's been done. The the benefit to a developer is going to be to develop this to the max. And if we do uh, if we change this to an MU1. Um, they can do that and they don't have to come to the village. They can put as many houses are allowed and they will, they can do what they have. They, they can follow the comp plan or they can add a little piece of green like they did at Butterfield or whatever they would like and they could comply with the code. And I think MU1 is just as bad, if not worse than I1. Can, can I try to frame it a different way? Because I'm, I'm hearing the perspectives that you're both putting forward. 
the difference. So MU1 came, came thoughtfully out of the process to accomplish particular purposes on the site, mixing uses, um, creating a, a density and massing that would be specific to that zone. When we had the discussion last week with Fink and first, the Fs, the, um, what was put forward was the idea that the PUD would in theory follow the guidance of the comprehensive plan as well regarding mixed use, that the, that the, the sort of the, the, the rough outlines of the MU would be contained in the PUD. I think what I hear Paul saying and what I, what I, I share a concern about is that right now, if it goes back to I-1, or if the change does not happen, what the developer might or might not come to the table and ask for the PUD. And if they don't ask for the PUD and they say, well, this is what I have to do as of right, I don't wanna go through this process anymore. I could under, under I-1, this is now I'm, I'm reading from the current code, right? Include manufacturing, assembling, which operation in the opinion of the planning board will not create any dangerous, injurious, noxious, or otherwise objectionable fire, explosive, radioactive, or other hazard, noise, or vibration, smoke, dust, odor, or other form of air pollution, electromagnetic, or other disturbance, glare, harmful discharge, storage, or dispersal of liquid or solid waste in a manner or amount as to so adversely affect the surrounding area. So I think that one of the, one of the goals of moving away from I-1 was to, was to, to try to limit manufacturing on that site in a surrounding residential area. Now, if, our under, if the underpinning zone, and I realized we had this conversation last week, but I'm, I'm sitting with it and thinking about it, and especially having seen it laid out in the way that it is now as, in this, as the spreadsheet, it brings to mind that the, under, the underpinning zoning needs to be should be be in conformance with comprehensive plan in the same way that the PUD should be in conformance with the comprehensive plan. So that if a developer doesn't choose to ask and to pull down the floating zone, there's still a boundary on the zone that conforms with the comp plan and IU1 does not. But that, and I want, and it, that's exactly my point as far as the, as the comp plan goes, which I've been told does have teeth and that you do have to follow those recommendations. And that's what they are recommendation as Ted pointed out and as I have. And so those recommendations, they couldn't build out just whatever they want because that's not in compliance with the comp plan. Right, but you would want, you would want the overarching goal of the comprehensive plan, which was to move away from industrial and to a mixed use on that site, you would want the underlying code to reflect that comp plan as well, so that you're moving in a direction that if they if the developer doesn't pull down the PUD, you're still moving toward the goal of the comp plan for that site. If you leave it as it was, you've you've thrown away all of the comprehensive plan process, the LWRS process. You've thrown away, you've thrown out all of that public comment for what three communications I, I, I don't I, I don't totally don't agree with you and I and I, if, if the comp plan is basically something that you have to abide by and follow then leaving it at I1 they will have to follow that which will be rather hard to do under the under the comp plans recommendations and I think that because of that with a PUD or the floating zone, that then that would bring it into compliance and 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 kind of be mated with the uh, with what the comp plan had in mind. But the PUD uh, only comes into effect if the developer applies for it. The underlying the underlying I, I, zone is I one, and but, that's where that's where they could go as of right. But the I, but the I of one can but I one can't just go with what what is of right. They have to also abide by the comp plan. They also have to go through the right, planning. but the zoning the code doesn't. The zoning code doesn't require anyone to comply with a comp plan. 
right? It doesn't so say that the plan has no that's no bearing on any. That's any not true. Building. That's not true. What's Mary saying? The plan, the planning board. No, you have to have a site plan. If one, if someone were to develop, let's just take I one. If someone were to want to develop I one as an industrial complex, um, they could do that only on the uh, one parcel, um, which is the 53 Kemble Avenue parcel. The other parcels are too small to conform with I-1. The, the planning board is bound to follow the comprehensive plan. So if someone were to say, I wanna put in a, uh, I'll use the example from a week ago, a sneaker manufacturer the planning board would con would review that application or site plan to determine whether or not it is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. So sure, but then the argument, the cross argument that that the property owner could make is, well, I as a right, this is what I can do, right? I'm, if I if I meet the setback, the bulk requirements, the height requirements, this use is on the books as an as of right use in this zone. So, so, before, right. so ahead, the planning board, board has to approve that and confirm that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So if that yeah. is what the goal is, why not make the zone consistent with the comprehensive plan? Because Can I jump in here for a second? One, I think that gives them way more flexibility, that could develop for way more flexibility and, and it gives us less control. Flexibility and in what way? Right now under I-1, you could end up with lots, you could end up with one big manufacturing plant and all those residential lots at the end under the current zoning. And is that? No, the current ones, the current ones, not I-1 requires a 40,000 square foot lot. And a 40,000 square foot lot on a resident, for a residential lot in the village? Sorry, I-1 says I got that, that minimum lot size for I-1 is 40,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is one parcel that conforms to that size. And that's the, um, uh, the parcel on row 23. The other parcels do not conform to that size. So in my opinion, if uh, a person came forward and said, I want to develop row number 30 as a single family house, in I-1, mm, that wouldn't work. It's not big enough. So, so Maria, can you help me understand why, what is it about, I, first of all, I wanna make clear that I think that the PUD is an excellent structure and tool, and I think it's a good, it's a good thing to do, but I think that the underlying zoning should reflect the comprehensive plan as well. I'm, I'm wondering what has shifted for you Marie, that that you have, you feel comfortable stepping away from all of the groundwork that you laid as part of the comprehensive plan and the code update to move to MU one. What is the how? Where does that comfort level come from? Um, the comments that we received back from three people mm -hmm. at after after years of public comment. Look, we just we took we just took advice from council. And, and the reason why we hired the, the uh, CMR was because of their planning background and, and their land use background. And, and we also were talking to Ted Frank, who's a planner, and both agreed at the meeting that this is the way we should do this. Okay, this, so this, this, they, is, this they is where I have it a problem. As an option, but they didn't say we had to do it. No, they, they, what they said was comments, everything right? should conform that, with the comprehensive plan. I'm sorry, they, Paul. They said, they said that at the meeting that they recommended, that's the way we go. They didn't say we had to do that. They recommended that we did this, that we move it back. And I agree with them. And, and it takes, and, it, and all, you, all you need to now, and what this structure does is it allows the developer a lot of flexibility once that other zone is created to work with the village and the village to work with them to get a you know a development that can satisfy as much as possible both both parties but what's the motivation if you're the property owner what is the motivation for you to come to the village board and say look i've got all of these i've got all of these uses available to me under i1 that will give me 
not only reasonable return, going back to our previous conversation, but highest and best use under an I-1 zone, what would be the motivation for that, for that property owner to come in and ask to go through the public process to pull down the PUD? What understanding that it would that it would be another public process that looked like previous public processes that landed on the conclusion to change to MU1. I don't think there's any developer that's going to develop an I1 and not, I don't see them not wanting to, I'm not a developer, but I can see having multiple uses on that property and working the village as being way more advantageous than have, leaving this as an I1. That's just a personal opinion. And, and, and they, but you are not the property owner. I know. But the either property owner doing, has either the property owner own, has own. No, own I'm not. But I'm years. saying if I were the property owner, if I were the property owner, I could understand not seeing the motivation and saying, you know what, I these are the uses I'm allowed to do. I'm going, I'm going to stick with what I'm allowed. You know, we had another public comment last week that I think is 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 worth um bearing some consideration. And that was the, the, the neighbor who looks, lives directly across the street on Kimball Avenue, who raised the point, if we do not change to MU1, what's to keep the developer from developing it as the as of root of right I1 uses? And I think he's right. There is no, there is no, there is no motivation to pull, pull down the PUD. And was the that motivation to pull down the PUD, if, if he doesn't pull down the PUD, at least the MU1 retains the goals of the of the outcomes of the comprehensive plan. Yeah, but the and MU1 the I1 doesn't. The MU1 never gave any regulations in terms of totally making that a mixed use property. No, it, it was an option can, though. No, but what it says you can, you can build a lot more housing on an MU1 property than you can on an I1 property because it goes back down to residential sizes. Right, because and those sizes are 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 compatible never, with village lots. The, the, the lot be, sizes, it would, and that would make it very complex, very crowded. And for the person who was worried about ingress and egress, and you know traffic and so on and so forth, uh, the amount amount of residences you could put there wasn't it wasn't there was no reason for anybody to make this a mixed use place, other than hey, good that that allows me to build a whole bunch of houses. Or well, hey, that was that the point of the MU one was to allow that to allow the capacity to mix was, uses. To me, a, to me, a mixed use should be really mixed use and it wasn't. It didn't give, hey, you know, this should be mixed, partly residential, partly retail, partly, you know, grass, partly whatever. There, there wasn't any of that there. Uh, and so we were missing something in the process. And uh, so and now you have none of that. Well, under let me just go back for a second. Didn't we last week vote yes. unanimously yes. to change? We did, we did. We, we did. did. Tonight, tonight we were just talking about properties that were I1 going to R's, R1s and R3s. So, you know, I understand the back and forth here, but you know, we have a public hearing on this next week, right? Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'm sort of at loss as to why we're going back and forth. I appreciate the Paul reason we that. are. The reason we are is that when Marie sent the spreadsheet round, and I saw Mayor's Park and the pavilion and the highway garage and the water treatment plant all being proposed as MU1 and now falling back to I1, that made me question, wh wh why? Why is that not Parks and Rec? And then no it offense, led to, no the offense, to, the, to the consideration of, all right, so now if it stays industrial and the village were to, for whatever reason, sell mayor's lot, you'd have the same situation on the waterfront that would allow manufacturing. No offense or anything, Kathleen, I don't want to but the spreadsheet has been on Google Docs since day one. It really has. Grant, I understand that. We are yeah. having the conversation about yeah. 134 okay. now, so and I'm looking one, at it with fresh eyes. We had the 134 eyes. conversation a while back, and the spreadsheet has been available. So uh, we I, had not like proposed, like we had not proposed the changing until last week. Was there any proposal to oh. shift from MU1 until last week? So no, I do we, take offense we, because we've, we, we're looking at this in a different way now. Okay, I, I'd just like to comment on one thing. You, you mentioned this person that, that made the comment about looking at cross V and the Meyer. impact of I-1. Well, did they compare that to what the impact will be with MU-1? No, they didn't because it'll be the same or worse. You know, there was nothing, there was nothing to base that on. Like you're, 
you're just making assumptions that, that they're going to build this out and how many people are going to be going in and out, which is also a problem. You're not going to be able, the zoning or the planning board's not going to allow without some type of egress and ingress, which is the problem with this piece of property for a huge industrial complex down there, which some people are envisioning in doing, which he's not going to do. But we don't know that. And so why so would we want to leave that on the table? We agreed on putting a PUD into effect and bringing this back to I-1 right. at the and recommendation of the attorney, which we hired to help us and guide us through this, and a professional planner who we've also hired to help us guide us through this. Right. So and okay, so when, know, when, when we were working talking, on the code please, update committee. Please, I'm talking just for a okay. second. I know it's could, hard to could get you give me a minute? other people, but I just don't understand why we would go against recommendations made by people that were paying to give us recommendations because you disagree with them. I'm going to go with John First and Ted Fink over, over you, Kathleen. I'm sorry, I am. You have strong opinions and you have your, you know, and that's good. I have strong opinions too, but I'm going on who we're ask, asking, asking who has background in this and that should be able to guide us. They didn't say, I don't know, this that might not be a good idea, or if you do this, they could do build this out. There was no, there was no was sound, like uh, there was nothing from that that made me think that going back to the I-1 and then putting a PUD zone floating above that was to a disadvantage to the, uh, to the village or would have a, a terrible outcome or else I wouldn't be for it. So let me, can I ask you a question, Dave? Uh, is it, are we all aware, do we all understand fully that the PUD would only kick in if the property owner asked to apply to have it pulled down? Absolutely. Okay. And so, and so that, that tells me, I'm asking and a I question. You are comfortable. You are that, that I think you mean, I, what, by in saying that, I think you mean that you are comfortable with the uses that are currently allowable under I-1 and you are comfortable stepping away from the recommendations of the comprehensive plan to change this zone to MU-1. That's not, a, not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the PUD will actually allow us to conform more with the comprehensive plan. And, and no, I don't think that- If the developer, the developer asks for it. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't pull down onto, the, it's not, it's not a zone change. Yes. It's a all floating right. zone. It doesn't apply to the zone until it's requested for the yeah, zone. I think we all understand that, Kathleen. I really we do. We understand that. We understand Okay. That. If you understand it, then fine. And, and the I-1 district also, anything that has to be done has to go through the planning board. And that's, that's a big, important part of it. I think Paul had something to say to the comprehensive plan. It's not like they just say this is what's allowed and throw that throw the comprehensive plan away because what good would the comprehensive plan be at all, regardless of what zone you were in? So if then it, why not make the zone some, change that's recommended? Have, I'm speaking. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it's really tough. And then I raise my it voice. It is tough on Zoom, Dave. I'm, I'm sorry. Or some other crap. It's like, it's really hard. It really, really is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, David. It is hard on Zoom. It is. Yeah, it is. When I'm talking and someone's talking over me constantly. So we, as, as I'm, I'm, I'm fine with these changes. That's what we were discussing tonight. Um, with, 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 with you like to do, Marie, I think that it makes sense putting the the ones that were in I-1 that are actually residential properties that will lose no, you know, use of their property to the R1s and R3 as proposed. And I have no problem with bringing everything else back to the I-1 that you have listed in green. Okay. Fran? I'm fine. We voted on the, um, the MU-1 back to I-1s last week, and I'm fine keeping that. The I-1s that are going to R1 and R3, and I think there's a couple of PR1s in things that were split all over the place. I'm fine with putting them to the new proposal, R1, R3, or PR, as long as there's nothing MU, because MU was the one that we pulled out of that. I'm sorry, did you say my name? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's hard. I'm having a hard time hearing you tonight, Marie. I'm sorry. No, 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 um, it's I, I, I have, I'm, I'm fine with the, the properties in yellow. I have real concerns about um, the shift away from mixed use on those sites. And I also have, I, I, I still am, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled why 
I'm baffled about the mayor's park not not being classified as Parks and Rec. I understand. I understand it was. It's this. This you're concerned about splitting a lot, but um, I think what I think that turning the back, turning our backs, and not modifying the underlying zoning to conform with the comprehensive plan is a mistake. Um, and that's where I stand because the PUD doesn't get doesn't get used unless it's called down. This goes for public hearing next week anyway, right on on the fourteenth. Yes, there is. Okay. So from what I'm hearing, there's a majority would like to uh, to accept the uh, changes that Maria's uh, made. I don't need to vote on that, I don't believe. If you'd like, I'll, I'll take a vote if that needs to be done. Jeff, do we need a vote? I, I'm i confused. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, yes, you should. I think you would take okay. no problem last, with the change okay. that we had made. Okay, so last week we did vote to bring the uh, MU1 back to I1. A number of them, as Marie has pointed out, now in yellow, she would like to move um, to R1 and uh, PR1. Is there also an R3 there or no? Yeah. Yes. Can we share the screen again, please? I'll, I, never mind, I'll pull it up in Excel. There you so go. what is the motion? So the motion is to accept Marie Trustee Early's recommendation that we move the, how many properties are there, Marie? Um, One, two, three, four, five. 14. Six. It should no. be 14. Sorry, to total properties. Okay, I can't control it. There are 14 in the yellow section, if that's what we're looking at. How many are there total, Fran? 57. 57. But what we're talking about is the recommendation is to change the ones in yellow that are highlighted in yellow on our screen at this moment from uh, from the I-1, which we voted on last week, to the recommendation of R-1, R-3, and uh, PR-1. So which are the recommendations? What's that? The code up, these are the recommendations the Code Update Committee did early on. No, the code update committee, uh, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong on this, the code update committee never I, identified the problem of uh, si a single lot having being identified as being in multiple zones. Oh, we definitely talked about that. Did we make a recommendation? <clears throat> I do not know if we made a recommendation. We did talk about specific lots and we also talked about sh changing certain lots to go from one to another as the ones you were talking up on Wall Street. Okay. So um, we definitely Wall discussed that. Oh, uh, the Wall Street lots. Okay. Well, we, there, that was just an example. We discussed others yeah. as well. Yeah. And I see that, you know, I understand your impetus to, to rectify some illy, ill uh, assigned lots previously, but then I'm also surprised at all of these lots in green because having those, if you're going to, since you voted and now keep I-1, most of those lots make no sense in I-1. So the, the logic is completely inconsistent here. Okay, thank you. That's for one opinion. argument. I, I have other things to say, but I guess I'll have to have, wait for the public hearing. Is that right? Because Dave, you've characterized some things I really object to. Okay. Thank you for your opinion. And uh, we'll hear you at the uh, public hearing. You uh, certainly will. So no need to get angry. Um, so <laughs> I would like, I'd like to make the motion um, or Marie, would you like to make the motion on your recommendations? Since okay, so uh, I'm, uh, I make a motion that the lots that are highlighted in yellow um, move from their current zoning code to the to the proposed zoning codes of R1, R3, and PR1. The lots that are highlight that have no color highlighting, I'm um, that motion to move them from their current zone to PR1, R1, and uh, there are some at the bottom. Uh, Fran, can you scroll down? Uh, sure, give me a second. Uh, uh, there's a, a right. B4A. There's a B4A, thank you. Uh, and problem. again, as, yeah, as I pointed out, the, the uh, rezoning for from B4 to B4A never included a change to the zoning map. And then the, the, the lots that are highlighted in green, which are 
currently I-1, which were proposed to be moved to I MU-1, be retained as I-1? So isn't that a isn't the MU-1 to I-1 the vote we took last week, Marie? Yes, it was, and it was approved unanimously. Oh, so we shouldn't have to add that tonight, right? Correct. Okay. So it's just the yellow and white. Okay. I second your motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 On the yellow and white, aye. Yep. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, we're getting to 9.05 from 6.30, so... I believe we should uh, adjourn unless uh, before we get even more tired. And uh, so I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. And before you, can I ask a question, please, before we go? What I was the out? I have, I have a motion to adjourn. I just want to know the outcome of the I portion have a I missed. To adjourn. Good night. I have a motion to adjourn. I'm Do not I have voting. A Good night. Do I have a second? second? I'll second. All in favor? All right. Thank you.